Good morning everyone and welcome to morning prayer on Monday the 19th of June uh, 2023 <laughs> just to specify the year. Um, due to technical difficulties this will be being uploaded a little bit later than um, Monday morning at 9am but um, um, I hope that, um, that that is okay and um, and we will be praying. Um, today the church uh, so celebrates Sundar Singh of India, um, who was a holy man, an evangelist and a teacher of the faith from 1929. And I've just got a little bit to read about him. So Sundar Singh of India. He was born of wealthy Sikh parents. Sundar Singh was converted to Christianity after experiencing a vision. He was baptised in the Anglican Church at Simla in 1905. In an endeavour to present Christianity in a Hindu form, he donned the robes of a sadhu or holy man and travelled much around the Indian subcontinent. He even made a visit to Tibet, where he persisted in strenuous work despite ill health. He went missing there, presumed murdered in April 1929. So that's Sundar Singh of India. But let us come before God in prayer this morning. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Blessed are you, sovereign God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise for ever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time you made us in your image. And in these last days you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts, your Spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us, let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 44 Rise up, O Lord, to help us. We have heard with our ears, O God, our forebears have told us all that you did in their days and time of old. How with your hand you drove out nations and planted us in, and broke the power of peoples and set us free. For not by their own sword did our ancestors take the land, nor did their own arm save them. But your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you were gracious to them. You are my King and my God, who commanded salvation for Jacob. Through you we drove back our adversaries, through your name we trod down our foes. For I did not trust in my bow. It was not my own sword that saved me. It was you that saved us from our enemies and put our adversaries to shame. We gloried in God all the day long and were ever praising your name. Rise up, O Lord, to help us. But now you have rejected us and brought us to shame and go not out with our armies. You have made us turn our backs on our enemies and our enemies have despoiled us. You have made us like sheep to be slaughtered and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a pittance and made no profit on their sale. You have made us the taunt of our neighbours, the scorn and derision of those who are round about us. You have made us a byword among the nations. Among the peoples they wag their heads. Rise up, O Lord, to help us. My confusion is daily before me, and shame has covered my face. At the taunts of the slanderer and reviler, at the sight of the enemy and avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and have not played false to your covenant. Our hearts have not turned back, nor our steps gone out of your way. Yet you have crushed us in the haunt of jackals, and have covered us with the shadow of death. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to any strange God, will not God search it out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. But for your sake are we killed all the day long, and are counted as sheep for the slaughter. 
Rise up, O Lord, to help us. Rise up, why sleep, O Lord? Awake and do not reject us for ever. Why do you hide your face and forget our grief and oppression? Our soul is bowed down to the dust, our belly cleaves to the earth. Rise up, O Lord, to help us, and redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Rise up, O Lord, to help us. In the darkness of unknowing, when your love seems absent, draw near to us, O God, in Christ forsaken, in Christ risen, our Redeemer and our Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Ezra chapter 1 In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia, so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom, and also in a written edict declared, Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides free will offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. The heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbours aided them with silver vessels, with gold, with goods, with animals, and with valuable gifts, besides all that was freely offered. King Cyrus himself brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. King Cyrus of Persia had them released into the charge of Mithredath, the, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shezbazar, the, ping, the prince of Judah. And this was the inventory. Gold basins. 30. Silver basins, 1,000. Knives, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Other silver bowls, 410. Other vessels, 1,000. The total of gold and silver vessels was 5,400. All these Shezbazar brought up when the exiles were brought up from, Jeru from Babylonia to Jerusalem. So this is the first chapter of Ezra. And funnily enough, although Ezra is called Ezra, we don't actually meet Ezra himself until chapter seven. So we start off with the decree of Cyrus proclaiming that the those who had been exiled by the Babylonians, by King Nebuchadnezzar, could finally return to their homes after being scattered across um, Babylonia. So Nebuchadnezzar had sacked uh, Jerusalem, taken it over, sent sent all the um, Israelites into exile. And this is the point at which, after years, they're finally able to return home. And he allows them and, and actually assists them um, or gets the surrounding area and the people um, to assist them to rebuild their holy temple, uh, the temple of the Lord. And so it's a huge thing. I can't even um, imagine how that must have felt to these people, to be to the people at the time, to finally, after years, have, have this edict from the new the, the king, um, Cyrus, and finally be able to have have his <laughs> his blessing um, to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their holy. Uh, the holy temple of the Lord. And Cyrus's um, policies, in a sense, were to um, basically, in his view, um, it was a good idea to um, to pacify 
any of the gods in his kingdom because he ruled over this very diverse sort of kingdom of Persia which had many different communities and groups with many different gods and his policy was basically we just need to keep all the different gods happy and so if the god of Jerusalem <laughs> which is what he thought is uh, the temple is currently destroyed because um, the, the Babylonians had sacked it he said he, his policy was that the best the best way of dealing with that was to rebuild that temple, re um, um, bring the the, diff, the the peoples back, be, bring peoples back from Israel from from exile. And he didn't just do this with the Israelites; he did it with other peoples who had been sent into exile, according to the previous um, the, the Babylonian policy. <laughs> um, and so he brought people back. His policy was to bring people back from es exile and to rebuild to um to set up the temples to these the individual gods of these different communities across his whole huge empire um and so that might that's sort of part of the reason where, where cyrus is coming from but obviously in this um in the scripture it's seen as um the stirring of cyrus's heart towards um the israelites and towards uh, the lord um, in allowing them back and in helping them to rebuild the temple. Um, and I think what's super interesting for me is the reaction. And so it says the heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And so God is stirring in the hearts of all the people when they hear this. Uh, edict from Cyrus and it's a, a massive thing to um to then uproot again and to go back and rebuild like I can't even imagine it it must have been awful it's 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 reminding me it's making me think of um of the places like Ukraine and the refugees who've had to go and leave and build different lives in different settings in different countries whilst seeing um areas and homes destroyed and bombed and sacked and then the thinking of going back to rebuild say Mariupol could just the idea of having of, of returning home to to rubble um just goes kind of beyond belief really but in here it's talking about these people being the the heads of the families of judah and benjamin the priests and the levites their spirits being stirred to do just that and to return to face what um has been many years rubble to uproot themselves again from where they are based in exile where they've actually potentially made some new routes but to go back and to rebuild and um commit to um renewing the community and the holy sites there so that's very that was inspiring for me that was encouraging for me um it <laughs> resonates with some current um political events and i think we'll, we'll just be praying for all those in exile at the moment or refugees who are still not at the place where they can return home but um, are still in that place of feeling uprooted and uh, in exile but pray for the stirring of God's spirit in uh, leaders of the world of nations as well so I'll move on to the canticle all the earth shout and sing for joy for great in your midst is the Holy One. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. On that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing God's praises who has triumphed gloriously. Let this be known in all the world. Shout and sing for joy, you that dwell in Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. All the earth, shout and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One. A reading from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 18. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed for ever. Amen. It is not as though the word of God had failed. For not all Israelites truly belong to Israel, and not all of Abraham's children are his true descendants. But it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named after you. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Nor is that all. Something similar happened to Rebecca when she had conceived children by one husband, our ancestor Isaac. Even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose of election might continue, not by works, but by his call, she was told the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. What then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomsoever he chooses, and he hardens the heart of whomsoever he chooses. So this passage from Romans um, by Paul is right on the, um, comes straight after, well, chapter eight, chapter nine comes after chapter eight, but the end of chapter eight ends with that amazing um, promise that nothing, neither heights, nor depths, nor angels, nor rulers, nor powers, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So it ends on that sort of massive just climax and promise of God's love and that nothing can separate us from God's love and then it just goes <laughs> it then Paul then falls falls into this um into this chapter where he's speaking about great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart and then <laughs> and you're sort of left going where did that come from um but here after um after that, after chapter eight, where he's been talking about the the love of God for 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 all, he then goes, he then shifts to talking about his fellow Israelites, and he's lamenting the fact that not all the Israelites are coming around to to Paul's view of things and coming to basically understand that Christ is the Messiah and the fulfillment of the um the 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 Jewish prophecies and Paul is then is now is lamenting the fact that not all of the of the Israelites are coming to Christ and he's asking questions like is it that is it because the word of God has failed is it because there is injustice on God's part and the whole of chapters 9 to actually 11 are exploring the questions of what does it mean that not all of Israel is, in Paul's view, understanding that Christ is the Messiah and not accepting that. Is that a deficiency? Where is that coming from and what's going on there? And so this passage that we've got here is at the very beginning of that exploration. So it feels quite sort of 
disjointed to just have this bit here because it's part of a whole argument that sweeps over the next two chapters and it ends in ends it it reaches its sort of fulfillment in chapter 11 where Paul basically goes ultimately God is going to encompass the whole of Israel and embrace the whole of Israel in God's salvation and Paul is giving uh, giving a kind of a confident um a statement of 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 of, of God's heart to embrace um, all the all the Israelites, but at the beginning, he's expressing that anguish. He's saying he even goes he sa he goes as far as saying, "I wish I could that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people." So he's almost wishing to do give that sacrifice of himself in the same way that um, Moses did um, for the sake of saving and kind of bringing the the rest of his people the israelites uh, to christ so yeah it's it's difficult he's asking those difficult questions that i think are sometimes quite relatable for at least for me maybe for others uh, in times of where we're sort of wondering what God is doing, wondering what is the cause of things happening around us, wondering where God is in times of difficulty, in times of struggle, where we don't know what God is doing. Why is God, for Paul, why is God letting, why is God not showing all the Israelites what, the truth? Why is, why is God leaving them to not accept Christ? For Paul, in Paul's view, that's a struggle, a real struggle for him uh, or for, and for those that he's speaking to. And why we might have other questions like that and what are leading us to ask questions like, is it that the word of God is failing? Is is there injustice in God? What's causing this? And so I think those those sort of questions that Paul is asking are very, at least very reson resonating with me. Because we're sort of, and I guess it's part of being in that state of waiting, in that state of understanding the fact that Christ has 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 um has been victorious through the cross and has given us freedom and has broken the chains of sin and death and that God will ultimately be all in all as the scripture says but we're still in that place at the moment of kind of not yet we're not at the final fulfillment um that is promised in the future when Christ will come again but we're still waiting for that we have that hope of that and that expectation of that in the future but we're still at the point where we're waiting we don't we don't have all the answers we don't um we don't know um so I guess I'll be I'll be praying for for people who are asking those questions for anyone who might be struggling um struggling with the 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 doubt of others around them friends family struggling with our own doubts questions around what god is doing struggling with any just difficult being in difficult situations right now where you don't where we can't see where god is in that But ultimately, it's um, it's difficult to, and sometimes we just can't see where where God is in the situation until at the moment, or in any, there are some situations where we can't um, really discern that. But it's Paul's belief that in 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 um, in Romans that that God is close and God is God is at work and God is close by even when it's really difficult to know how and what that looks like at the time so i'll do the responses trust in the lord with all your heart and be not wise in your own sight trust in the lord with all your heart and be not wise in your own sight in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths trust in the lord with all your heart glory to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit Trust in the Lord with all your heart and be not wise in your own sight. 
you've set us free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous in your sight. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. You have set us free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous in your sight. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this new day, this new week. We pray that you will be abiding closely with us in our hearts giving us strength and guiding us in all that we are to do today and this week. Lord, shine upon us, shine upon those around us, those we encounter. Give us your encouragement, give us your joy. And help us to know your presence today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we read in the Old Testament reading in Ezra about the return of the exilic community into rebuilding from the rubble and the dust of a broken city. We pray for all the refugees, pray for all those who have been exiled from their homes Pray for those for whom their homes have been broken. That, Lord, you would be dwelling close to them. Pray for those who are settling new roots in new communities. We pray for welcome for them, for an embracing. We give you thanks for all those refugees in our own communities, for the blessings they bring. And pray, Lord, that you will be stirring in the hearts of all your people, and particularly stirring in the hearts of the rulers of nations, of countries, of governments. Let your peace and justice might stir them and we pray for your peace, your renewal, that when the time comes to rebuild that you will be stirring in hearts, giving the resources, giving your strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we heard from Paul in Romans, we pray for all who are struggling, all who might be struggling with questions about where you are at the moment. In difficulty, where you are, what you are doing, how you are working, where you seem distant or absent. Lord, we just pray that all who are struggling might know your presence so closely, no matter what is going on. That you would be filling them with your comforting and healing spirit. We raise before you the names of any people we are anxious about, worried about 
anyone who needs, who really needs to know your presence right now. Let me offer them before you, Lord. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to come upon them. Fill them with your light and surround them with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for those around us, for our friends, for our families, for our communities, for all who have been with us on our journey. For all who have helped us to see you and where you are working in our lives. We pray for your protection upon all those whom we love, for your blessing upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I hope you have a lovely rest of day, everyone. Um, well, whenever, at whatever point you uh, see this. <laughs> and, um, and God bless, and I'll see you soon. Bye.